Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government, law, and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. In a week dominated by heart sickness and fury over the murder of 19 grade school students by a barely 18-year-old boy with an AR-15, We present today one of our periodic episodes focused on the economic state of the nation and the world, ending with a segment on the shootings. The country seems balanced precariously on a seesaw that risks on the one side excessive inflation and on the other a recession. Much of it is the product of the war in Ukraine and residual effects of COVID. Moreover, the glum mood of many Americans, unnerved by $70 prices at the gas tank, is itself a factor for regulators to reckon with. And the fallout of an economic stumble will be laid at the doorstep of President Biden, whether he can do much about it or not, as the national focus turns to the midterms. And the brooding extends to the worldwide landscape, as evidenced by the attitudes on display at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where attendees are wrestling with the prospect of a global recession, driven in large part by the dislocations brought on by the war. To try to trace these unsettling developments to their economic roots and stack them up against the perceptions of citizens and consumers in the U.S. and worldwide, We welcome a fantastic group of economic and policy experts, and they are Austin Goolsby, the Robert P. Gwynn Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He serves on the Economic Advisory Panel to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, but he previously served as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Obama. He's been named one of 100 global leaders for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum and one of the six gurus of the future by the Financial Times. It's his first time on Talking Feds. We're really thrilled to welcome him. Thanks so much, Professor Goolsby. Thank you, Harry. (laughs) Betsy Stevenson returns to Talking Feds, a professor of public policy and economics at the University of Michigan. Her work on the labor market in particular has been published widely. She served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors from 2013 to 2015, advising President Obama on social policy, labor market, and trade issues, and previously served as the chief economist for the U.S. Department of Labor. Welcome back, Betsy Stevenson. Great to talk with you again. And Congressman Raja Krishnamurti returns. He represents the 8th District of Illinois. He serves, among other committees, on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. Before entering Congress, he served in a number of offices in Illinois state government. Thanks so much for coming back to Talking Feds, Congressman Krishnamurti. Hey, good morning. Thank you. All right, let's jump in with the situation at home where the economy remains, I guess you could say lackluster, but Americans' opinions about the economy seem to be even worse. So the focus of most assessments seems to be inflation, which began to spike around the end of last year, reaching rates not seen in 40 years, and thus far eluding the efforts of regulators to sort of wrestle it to the ground. The CBO predicted last week that high inflation is going to continue through the end of the year, potentially cooling to something like 4.7%, which is still a lot higher than the Fed's 2% target. So let me just start there with whether you accept this prognosis. Well, you you know well that economists, we fight about predicting things that have already happened. So I don't want to get into the prediction (laughs) of of what the inflation rate will be. I'm hopeful that the new months of inflation, that is, when they announce inflation, it looks backward for 12 months. And we already know what 11 of the 12 months were. So what we find out each month is a new month of inflation. I'm hopeful that the new months of inflation by this summer will start to cool somewhat significantly. If they don't, then I think that that opens up a whole new battle line in the religious war between economists 
arguing over, did this come from supply shocks or did this come from excess demand? And the wider economy, I mean, it's still kind of weird. Yes, there is inflation. That's the worst part. But the best part is an extremely strong job market. And it's still a little strange that people view the economy's performance to be as negative as they do. And I guess I kind of think, and as anybody who's a teacher that gets teaching evaluations knows, if they decide they're angry, you could be the most organized person in the world. Your score on are were you organized will be low and your score on everything else will be low if they're mad and people are mad. And I think part of the mad is from the virus. If you remember a year ago, this was supposed to be done by last summer yeah. and it wasn't. And I think that put everybody in a kind of a sour mood. Okay. So quite a lot there. And actually, Congressman, what about specifically this idea that people seem mad and sort of glum disproportionately to the economic facts on the ground as best as Austin points out, we can discern them. What do you see as the impact above and beyond the hard numbers of the bad mood out there, whether driven by COVID or anything else? First of all, I, my constituents are unhappy. I think they are summed up with two issues that they are complaining to me about, which is gas and groceries. One fill up at the pump is costing my average constituent about 50 to 100 bucks, which adds up very quickly and erodes maybe the wage increases they may have seen or the salary bump. And I think that that makes them mad. And then the second is you see the grocery prices going through the roof. Um, it's double digit increases. And Unfortunately, when you go to some of these stores, you're also just simply seeing some shelves that are bare of some of the items that people want. And of course, we can talk about baby formula later in this program if you want. Yeah. But that particular issue, I think for a lot of people, crystallized just how uncertain the economy is for them and their families and their babies right now. So it has political ramifications for sure. I think from our standpoint, we have to do whatever we can to stabilize the situation, whether it's on infant formula or whether it's on gas and groceries. We have to direct infrastructure spending from the bipartisan infrastructure deal to help unwinding the bottlenecks that still disrupt the supply chains. And then we have to get going on things that will get people back into the labor market, such as helping folks with childcare, which is still plaguing my constituents keeps a lot of single moms still at home. And so these are some of the things that I think the current inflationary situation point to. Betsy, let me try to bifurcate what the congressman just said, because you've tweeted out that the goods profile or landscape, actually, you know, we had a pretty good month. It's looking up but your focus is on services and you let's, think Let's that back that's, up a little bit, yeah. Harry. Let's start with one thing. It's just gas prices. Americans are so sensitive to gas prices. I think we yeah. could be running the inflation we were running right now, but if for some reason we had record low gas prices, people would be like, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. It's not the other prices they worry about. And I really, I've spent years trying to think about this, and I think it's because you stand at the pump and you literally watch the dollars flying out of your pocket, and everybody can tell you how much it costs to fill their tank, and they can tell you how much it costs to fill their tank when gas was cheap, and they can tell you how much it costs to fill their tank now, and they can see that difference, and then they get mad. Pew came out recently with a survey that said 70% of people think inflation is a very big problem. Right? This is a lot of people, 70% of people. In 2013, when inflation was running below 2%, over 50% of people in the same Pew survey said inflation was a very big problem. Why? Inflation wasn't a problem, but gas prices were starting to tick up a little bit. So I think we need to realize those feelings that Austin was talking about. A lot of them reflect gas and food, and I get that that's important for people. But I've even done the math and said, let's take the lowest income families. I did this in 2013 when I saw how unhappy they were. And I was like, OK, gas prices are going up. What if I calculate a separate inflation rate for low income families that commute to work by car? It still wasn't that big, but it felt big. And so I do think that it's important that we realize that. 
The other disconnect between how people are doing and how they're feeling is that we have never had so many people, according to the Fed survey at the end of 2021, who could weather a financial storm, as people said they could. So we had people who said, what would you do if you had a $400 emergency? Higher share of families than ever before said they had the cash to pay for it. So the things that the federal government did put cash in people's pockets, and they know they can weather storms. But what they're seeing is help wanted signs all over, which is great for them, but they're worrying about the businesses in their community can't hire the people to provide the services that they want. And I think that they are worried about the prices that they face every day, which is things like milk and gas. And then they're hearing on the news inflation is out of control. And that, I think, is accelerating their their fears. So I think that's what's happening with individuals. Now let's think about me as an economist and how worried am I about inflation. My fear of inflation is that if it moves from where it has been largely concentrated, which is the goods producing sector and energy prices and housing, to the service sector, right? We haven't seen a lot of medical inflation, even though nurses are quitting left, right, and center, and they're sick of this job. We're seeing problems hiring teachers, but we don't see much inflation in education services yet. Uh, Education services running below 1%. So we've got inflation in these services that are well below or at the Fed's target. And I think we need to be forward-looking, not complaining about the inflation that happened in the past, but just asking ourselves, do we have the bandwidth in the labor market? Do we have the immigration policies necessary to expand hiring in order to make sure that we don't see inflation accelerate through services? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on your point about car prices. Annie Lowry's piece in The Atlantic talked about inflation as an everyone problem. I don't know if that's true if you're talking about, say, the housing market, but gas. This is ancient history, but if you read novels or have recollections of the 70s and the first great gas crisis, there was a sense in which gas and cars just strikes at something American and has a special injury and insult for the sense of Americans, their lifestyle is I've got my car, I go where I want to, I drive to work or I hit the open road. And that's just (laughs) compromised when you're really paying 70 bucks to fill your tank, which of course, many Europeans would thrill to do because they're used to much, much higher um, prices. Let me just bring a slightly different perspective to this because I've had numerous town hall meetings now. And yeah, You know, I'm besieged by constituents every day talking about different concerns that they have. I shouldn't say besieged, but I'm approached by them. And here's another issue which I just want to throw out there, which is I really think that there's real inflation out there across a a number of goods that small business people are facing and their inputs. They have been saying this to me for months now. And I think that when we, somehow tell them that things aren't bad as they are, that fuels further anger on their part. And it really doesn't help the conversation. I think we have to meet them where they are. And I think that although we're talking substantively about a real problem, I think from a political standpoint and from a just how are we going to help you standpoint, I, I don't think we should ever try to deny the reality of what people are facing or they perceive they're facing. Oh, let me, can I just jump in, Congressman, and say, I certainly do not want to imply that there isn't real inflation. There is. And I also don't want to imply that it's not hurting people. But I did want to emphasize that there are some prices that people feel more sensitive to. And those feelings are very real, even if it's not having as big of an impact on their budget as they might imagine that it's having, the feelings are very real and denying them certainly doesn't help. And I think we hopefully all know that you never make progress denying someone's feelings. The Fed's made very clear that it intends to continue to administer strong medicine. They've as much as said that the next two meetings will feature half point increases in interest rates. What's your thought of anybody about that, if it's too strong medicine and if it is too uh, risky for the prospect of bringing on a recession? Well, Harry, I'll start by saying if, if I'm ever 
thinking, what is the Fed going to do? I stand yeah. up, I walk over here, and I'm now sitting in Ben Bernanke's Fed chair. <laughs> okay, now I know what the Fed is going to do. All ben right. Bernanke gave you, me his you're Fed chair. You're channeling Bernanke. As a parting gift when I left DC. Yeah. The thing oh about God. the Fed is yeah. it seems like an academic point. This question of was the inflation from too much demand or was the inflation because of problems with supply? But it makes a huge difference for now. How much should the Fed raise rates? I think th there was a error, let's say, in the Fed's thinking. The error wasn't in March of 2020 when they were afraid that we were about to go off a cliff, the likes of which we have not seen worse even than the financial crisis. That's why they engaged in massive emergency measures. They cut every interest rate to zero. They massively expanded the balance sheet and they engaged in what we might think of as the emergency response. At least a year ago, it was clear that as bad as COVID is, it's not going to be the end of the world for the economy. We weren't going into a depression. So I think it's totally natural and normal that the Fed would move to something like the stance it was in before COVID began as conditions go back to what they were before COVID began. But if you think that a major part of the inflation came from supply shocks, then you have to remember that there was a lesson of the 1970s, which is if your inflation came from supply shocks, just raising the interest rate is not going to fix the problem. You will not get rid of the inflation. You can raise unemployment. You can create stagflation, but you won't solve the inflation because it wasn't coming from too much demand. So we've got an angel and a devil on our shoulders, and I, I'm not sure which one is which, but one says if you have inflation for too long, it's going to get in people's expectations, and then you have to be Paul Volcker and raise the interest rate to 20% to try to pound it out. And the other one says, well, wait a minute, be careful. If this was a supply shock, you could go too far. And so the Fed is just trying to balance that out. So I think in the short term, you're exactly right. They've said they're going to raise rates a fair amount. And I think that's normal. Let's get back to a more normal situation on rates. But there will be a time by the end of the summer, probably, when we're going to get a read on what does the new inflation look like and then we're going to have this second discussion of, are we moving too aggressively and might, might that generate a stagflation? So, Harry, can I just jump in? Because I want to make sure. Definitely. That... I was going to say I'm seeing vigorous nods from you as Austin was talking. Oh, I, I agree with everything he said. So I was actually just going to offer a little primer in case anybody listening uh, needs just a little bit more background. Everyone listening, I think Betsy does. Thank you. <laughs> What the Fed can do is impact demand. The Fed can't impact supply. And I know that does sound obvious to a lot of people, but I just want to make sure it's really clear. You know, the, what the Fed tries to do with interest rates is affect your choice about spending today versus spending tomorrow. So raise rates makes it expensive to spend today, makes it a better deal to spend tomorrow. And so when the Fed sees too much demand today, then raising rates is a really natural thing to do. Reduce the demand for today you bring down prices. Austin's point is that, well, if it's a supply chain problem, I mean, in some sense, yeah, you can lower demand to try to make sure that there's now less demand to deal with the fact that there's less stuff available. But I always think of this as giving like Tylenol for a fever due to COVID. Maybe the fever comes down a little bit, but you still got the COVID <laughs> and they're not really curing anything. And the thing that the Fed had to be really nervous about is, do they plunge us into a recession? And again, I'll use my Tylenol analogy. Sometimes they tell you, you know, don't treat the fever too much because the fever is your immune system working, trying to kick the disease. And I think that's the same sort of problem for the Fed is they need to not kick the fever too much or they might not allow the economy to solve the disease of working its way out through these supply chain problems. And I think it's been particularly problematic. And this doesn't normally happen in a recession. Consumer demand has been really whacked about because of the pandemic. All of a sudden, everybody wanted a home gym and nobody wanted to pay for a gym membership. Everybody wants stuff 
and they don't want to do things. They don't want to have experiences. So we see this big increase in demand for goods, and we see a big decrease in demand for services. And we actually haven't seen that equalize. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the wars you're hearing between economists are about, well, it's demand. And so when we see this summer, a huge increase in demand for services, inflation is going to spread like wildfire across all the services. You know, that's speculative. I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm seeing 500,000 people a month getting hired into new jobs. And if that keeps happening, we're not going to see inflation through services spread like wildfire. You know, the, the fear of a recession can actually do a lot of the work that the Fed's trying to do in cooling demand. That's really because interesting. if people start building up their savings, like, oh, who knows what's going to happen? We could have a recession. That's good in point. fact, I heard a Fed bank president speaking the other day who was saying, oh, you know, we could have a recession. And I was like, is this specific Fed communication trying to cool the economy by warning about a recession? Because if people start to cut back their spending because they're worried about a recession, then it'll cool the economy. And the Fed needs to be paying a lot of attention to that kind of behavior so they know exactly how much to raise rates because they don't want to raise rates too much. And I think that all the people who are yelling at the Fed to raise rates faster are not appreciating the fact that slowness gives them a little bit more control and allows them to watch how people are reacting. And it's not just interest rates that can cool demand. I mean, we saw during COVID that people built up a lot of savings out of fear. And the fear that inflation would be terrible is that they would just let go of all those savings at once. That would just be like a giant party. We haven't really seen them let go of all the savings at once, but we're starting to see them let go of it. But if these fears of a recession take off, I think they, they might pull back a little. I could use that party. Where is the party? <laughs> ask Ben, ask Ben. <laughs> but the last thing I say, and it, it kind of goes to what Betsy described previously, have some sympathy for the Fed because separate from having to process the argument of was this supply or was this demand, is the fundamental fact that this downturn looked nothing like anything in the historical record. So they don't really know how fast is it going to come back. Are people going to go on twice as long of vacations this summer because they didn't have a vacation for the last two years? Are they going to go to the dentist two times because they haven't been going to the dentist? And that question of how much pent-up demand for services is there is quite important for how hard do they want to step on the brake? Because if that's going to come booming back, then they're going to step on the brake harder. But there's no historical record to compare that. And the normal things that they look at, like these interest rate sensitive things, such as housing, TVs, consumer durables, and cars, that stuff went up in the downturn. People bought more TVs and people bought more housing. So it's a very confusing moment without really any historic precedent. So it's that's a tough spot for them to be in. I, I totally agree with that. And I, I want to just add a couple other things because it, it, it sort of drives me crazy when I hear people comparing this to the 1970s because there's so many ways in which it's different from the 1970s. Okay, first of all, you go back to the 1970s and we had an economy where – a lot of people, nearly half the private sector, was working in very cyclical industries, manufacturing, goods producing. And today, that's like 15 percent of the economy. And for normal sort of recessions, people's response to haircuts and dentists and doctors is just much more muted. And I don't think there's any reason to think that that's going to become massively cyclical out of nowhere just because it's a big share of the economy. So I think that's fundamentally different. I love the idea of unions and workers having bargaining power, but there is one downside to it, which is when you have most of your workers or a large share covered by collective bargaining agreements, it's easier for wage price spirals to take hold because you have people looking at the inflation and then they're coming back to their union and they're saying, hey, we got prices up six, seven percent this year. You better get us a seven percent raise. And so the union you know, negotiates hard for that 7% raise and the company gives a 7% raise and then raises their prices 7%. And then the same thing happens over and over again. That's a wage price spiral. Today, we have just a handful of workers covered by collective bargaining agreements that are in the private sector. Most people who are are in government. And I just don't think that we have the same accelerant 
that's possible through these wage price spirals in the 2020s that we had in the the 1970s. So I think there's just these things that are are fundamentally different that mean that I am less concerned that it's going to be as hard to put the brakes on inflation as it was in the late 70s, early 80s. That's all hugely interesting. And I'll just to put a cap on it. I think your point goes to show that this divide between perception and facts on the ground can cut both ways, in fact, and people can assume a rosier picture of things. And of course, unusually for troubled times, uh, they've got money in their pockets to, to maybe spend. So that makes it all a more difficult set of calculations. We've learned two interesting facts about maybe a, but they're about public perception. If you remember, at the end of the 70s, one argument of why inflation was so unpopular was that the tax code was not indexed to inflation. So even though your true wage was not going up, your tax rate was going up because the tax authorities were like, oh, you're getting richer and richer. And they changed that. So the tax code is now indexed to inflation, but people are still just as mad as they were before. So maybe the indexing didn't actually make any difference. And the second is you're now seeing a bunch of states and even some in the federal making the argument that there should be rebates, tax cuts, some kind of we're going to give you money to overcome the price increases. And the only thing I would caution them about that is that we did that in 2021. Prices for the average family were up about $2,500 and they got a $3,500 tax cut. So if you look at the actual income position of the average family, it was better, not worse, but that's not in the public perception. So I kind of, I guess, question the political logic of Let's go give out gift cards to overcome inflation. I don't think you will get very much credit for that, or at least they didn't get very much credit for that in 2021. And there's another way to think about that. Inflation redistributes, and some people don't do so badly under it. They get wage gains, the things that they buy, the prices aren't going up as high. Other people just tend to get hammered by it. Low-income people who are spending everything they own can get more hurt by it. The way to deal with redistribution in in the economy is to deal with redistribution in the economy, not let inflation deal with it, and certainly not hand money out to everybody to deal with inflation. If you want to cut taxes on diapers and baby formula and very specific targeted goods that help low-income families and raise them on luxury goods, you know, like Massachusetts has a sales tax where the taxes are higher on luxury goods and there's zero tax on the basics. No, it's a good time to try that out. Let's keep your revenue the same and let's redistribute. But that's a policy of redistribution, and it's not about fighting inflation. On the politics, though, I think when we think about things like business concentration, when we think about things like who's getting hurt, we leverage the moment to do more to fight some demons that actually have nothing really to do with inflation, right? It's like, so we could leverage the fact that the public is pissed and blaming anti-competitive policies for inflation. I don't think that businesses being too concentrated is causing inflation, but I think it's as good a time as any to fight concentration in our markets and make them more competitive. I think that we actually tried to redistribute disproportionately towards the bottom part of the income distribution, but we did it while giving to the middle and even the upper, upper middle, and we didn't take from anybody. So that's not really redistribution. That's caused inflation. So if we want to give money back to the families that are struggling the most, let's offset it with actually bringing that money from somewhere and not just trying to flood demand in the market. And let's get rid of the stupid Trump tariffs while we're doing it. Let me extend this metaphor at some peril and ask you, Congressman, so if that's right and the Fed has some Tylenol but not much more, the administration and Biden basically has nothing, maybe an ability to affect perceptions on the ground, but 
Nevertheless, he's the one who gets blamed for, you know, medical malpractice, as it were. So I I just wanted you to comment on how this plays out on the political sphere. The next step after their sour feelings is what's wrong with the president. And yet the way our system is set up, I don't know what really can a president and, and the administration as contrasted with the Fed do about inflation. Well, first of all, I go back to what I said before, which is we have to admit that there's a problem and we have to admit the reality of what my constituents and all Americans are facing and and not try to happy talk our way through this. It's serious. It's real. And of course, it hurts the most vulnerable the most. If you have higher gas prices and higher food prices, you know, low income people suffer. And I think we have to be uh, cognizant of that. All that being said, I don't think that the Biden administration and Congress should be paralyzed in the face of this inflation. I think we we do have to get going on certain issues. I'm very heartened that the Biden administration did release, for instance, oil from the Strategic Petroleum Oil Reserves to help to stabilize energy prices to some degree. And I think they should continue to do that. And I think they should do that in coordination with other governments. I think the way that they release the oil in the first instance in coordination with other governments really helped to tamp expectations of future oil price increases. Secondly, we have to bring this war in Ukraine to a successful close. I think that the Biden administration was absolutely correct to double and triple down on helping the Ukrainian government in waging battle with more modern weaponry. Uh, I think that The Ukrainians are fiercely and courageously making gains on the battlefield. And I think that that also helps to tamp fears about uncertainty related to energy prices and so forth. The third thing that I think we have to do is what I've initiated through my chairmanship of the House Oversight Subcommittee on Consumer and Economic Policy, which is I'm very concerned about certain corporate actors who, under the cover of inflation, are engaging in predatory pricing. And I'll just give you one example. In the meat processing industry, there are four companies that control about 80 to 90% of the market. And our consumers are seeing double-digit meat price increases across the board. And these companies are experiencing triple-digit profit growth right now, triple-digit, 500% increase in net income over the last two years. I think that's one area where the FTC needs to step in examining market concentration. It may not immediately result in lower food prices, but it certainly can send a signal. It's like a brushback pitch to those companies and others who might think about raising prices more. The last thing I would just say is global food prices are increasing right now, especially wheat prices. And I think that the Biden administration can help to coordinate and I'm going to be taking some action on this with regard to stabilizing world uh, wheat markets and other food markets with releasing food from our own reserves. And I think that we should do everything we can in these regards, and hopefully it has some effect in the coming months. It's now time for our sidebar, which this week focuses on the woeful state of gun violence in the United States and possible measures for sensible gun reform. And we are honored to have one of the leading voices in the country to explain it to us, Warriors coach Steve Kerr. Steve has been the head coach of the Golden State Warriors since 2014. In his first five seasons, he led the Warriors to five consecutive NBA Finals appearances. He also led the team to the all-time NBA best regular season record in 2016, earning him Coach of the Year award. Before his coaching career, Kerr played 15 seasons in the NBA and was then a five-time NBA champion, winning three finals with the Chicago Bulls and two with the San Antonio Spurs. More than that, as so many learned this week, he's a longtime passionate voice for sensible gun reform and a colleague of mine on the Brady Leadership Council. His advocacy in the wake of the Texas shootings has been a national inspiration. I give you Steve Kerr on firearm regulation. Every day, 300 people are shot in the United States and over 100 people are killed. 
Americans own twice as many guns per capita as any other country, and our homicide rates are at least 25 times greater than those of other developed nations. Since 1968, more Americans have died from gunshots than have died in combat in all the wars in American history combined. The Second Amendment confers a right to bear arms. But the Supreme Court and other courts have made clear that while a complete ban on private gun ownership isn't constitutional, the state and federal governments clearly have authority to enact far broader regulations of the sale, possession, and use of guns. The federal government already plays a major role in regulating firearm sales and possession. It places rules and restrictions on gun dealers, outlaws certain kinds of firearms, such as assault weapons, mandates background checks, and prevents certain people from buying and owning guns. Regulatory control of firearm sales allows federal law enforcement to bring special resources to bear in investigating crimes, including ballistic analysis. Where enforcement is concerned, federal criminal law imposes long sentences for certain crimes committed with guns and makes it illegal to buy a gun to pass on to someone who isn't eligible to own it. Some joint federal-state programs have achieved dramatic reductions in gun violence in individual communities. These programs typically combine a sharp focus on the most likely violent criminals with community intervention strategies to counter the root causes of violence. But so much more could be done. Recent years have seen repeated efforts to pass firearms restrictions in the wake of tragic incidents. Polls consistently show that the public wants such measures, but more often than not, efforts to put in place common sense restrictions die on the vine due to immense lobbying pressure from the NRA. There are also serious challenges on the horizon. One is the manufacture of so-called ghost guns. In other words, homemade guns with no serial numbers assembled with do-it-yourself kits readily available on the internet. The other is 3D guns, which can now be manufactured at home on a 3D printer using open source blueprints. Organizations like the Brady Campaign, to which both Harry Lippman and I belong, are working to achieve common sense gun control measures. These include extending background checks to every gun sale and transfer, expanding the categories of persons banned from owning guns, for example, hate crimes perpetrators, banning military style assault rifles and high capacity magazines, and extending existing laws to reach 3D printed firearms and ghost guns. For Talking Feds, I'm Steve Kerr. Thank you very much, Steve Kerr, who led his Warriors to yet another perch in the NBA Finals starting in a few days. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thanks, Harry. In today's spirited debate, the topic of seltzers bubbles up as we aim to address whether seltzers are friend or fad. Maybe you remember your first delicious dance with Zima back in the day, but for a lot of us, our first seltzer encounter happened poolside or at the beach a few years ago when White Claw opened the fizzy floodgates, creating a surge of seltzers to hit the market. Now, it seems like every week, five new fruity flavors enter the scene, from the smallest of independent labels to the biggest of brands. Take Anheuser-Busch, for instance, who pumped a billion dollars into their seltzer game this year, proving that seltzers are here to stay. And what's not to like about that? They're fun and exciting. They're light, crisp, and refreshing. They're lower in calories and carbs, which makes them less filling and easy to drink. So for now, we say let your seltzer flavor flag fly and stock up for the summer because this is one fizzy fad that shows no signs of fizzling out. So pick up a few of the newest flavors at your local Total Wine & More. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. The congressman's comments about the war and its impact on the national economy are actually a really nice transition to the second major topic I wanted to cover, which is the world economy. So the World Economic Forum in Davos went on last week. The general mood also seemed very gloomy. A quote from The Guardian, Ukraine war weighs heavy as apocalyptic mood shrouds Davos. Maybe that's a little bit of journalistic drama, but let me ask, 
Austin or Betsy to weigh in on the point that the congressman made. How much is the war affecting the world economy as you see it? Well, I'm not sure where Betsy's head is on it. My head, it's definitely had a negative impact. It's had a bigger negative impact on Europe than on anyone else because they were the most dependent on European supplies. But a lot of these are world commodities. So for oil, for wheat, for a bunch of minerals and nickel and things that go into the supply chain as well as to the food chain, it's clearly had an impact. The thing that I would highlight, and it kind of ties back to our inflation, is the U.S. has got the highest inflation in 40 years, and Germany has the highest inflation in 40 years, and Japan has the highest inflation in 40 years, and everybody has the highest inflation in 40 years. And if you look at the producer price index, which is a measure of inflation of business-to-business goods, producer price inflation has literally been double digits. It's been higher than consumer inflation, and it's been even higher in Europe and Asia than it has in the U.S. They're running inflation rates 15% plus. So I do think all of those point to some very disruptive shocks that are happening on a worldwide basis. So the same way you see American consumers and businesses in a bad mood, They're in a bad mood everywhere. Wherever you go, they're in a bad mood because this has been a rough period. So I think that COVID ended up erasing some of the efficiency gains that we had made over the years. You know, being able to do this sort of just-in-time inventory that kept prices down, being able to find the cheapest place in the world to do one part of a good that may involve now six countries, but that's going to produce it at the lowest cost. We used to be able to do that because we didn't have all these disruptions in moving the good around. Now that it's more expensive to move the good around, well, we can't take advantage of doing it in six countries. Now that's going to involve us having to rethink how we build and make things, but all of it means It's more expensive, not in the inflation terms, but in the real resources terms. And that, I think we hadn't really reckoned with the hit to potential GDP that COVID caused prior to Russia invading Ukraine. And Russia invading Ukraine, it's almost as if Putin understood he was whacking the world when the world was down. And I think it caused a great realization that boy, it's not going to get better. We just lost easy access to 25% of the world's wheat. We've just now gotten into an argument over a large share of the world's oil. Blah. And I think the glum mood is not just, like, if Putin had done this in 2019 or 2018, I'd think that we wouldn't have had the same reaction. But he's doing it coming at a time when we're realizing, oh, these supply chain clogs and the fact that everything costs a little bit more because we've got to take extra precautions or there might be a factory shut down here, that it came on top of that, I think has made it harder for people to think about how to absorb. Got it. So pulling that together, I think the most noteworthy story on the world stage this year has been the remarkable and triumphant cooperation of the world community against the Russian aggression. We've had some outliers or dissidents, maybe India, Europe, where it comes to gas and fuel. Is there a prospect that this kind of pressure and glum mood is going to dilute what's now the essentially unanimous resolve of the West to maintain strong sanctions against Russia? It's possible. But on the other hand, I think that the unity that you see with regard to Putin is grounded not on any kind of fleeting economic issue, but it's based in kind of a fundamental realization that we have a person who is assaulting democracy and our fundamental values themselves. And I think that in that regard, you see a resolve and determination that I think is uh, very deep. And I think Putin is probably bit off more than he could chew in terms of the response. That being said, we got to see it through to the end at this point. All right. So let's close out with a broader question about world economy and international cooperation. So sort of tracing it to the war, the tide's been arguably turned against Russia, as you say, but Russia and China 
are largely absent from international conversation. Biden's been meeting with allies in South Asia and the Pacific. Are we in a new moment in the international economic order and America's place in it? And if so, what does that look like? Possibly, yes, in the sense that I think that up till now, perhaps we were willing to maybe offshore and have numerous parts of our supply chain effectively controlled by the Chinese Communist Party or by other nations that quite frankly, we are adversarial to. And I think at this time, you can see it even in legislation, bipartisan legislation that's making its way through Congress, such as the CHIPS Act, also known as the Competes Act, which basically reflect the bipartisan realization that now we have to reshore much of our supply chain in critical industries and help our allies who might be facing the same problem and help them to wean themselves off of dependence on the Chinese Communist Party or the Russians. The other thing I would say is I'd like to see this help kickstart the immigration question, because I think it's a no-brainer that at this point, immigration is kind of the competitive killer app that America has that can also help to bring down prices long-term. We might also engage in perhaps a new round of looking at tariffs with regard to countries that um, actually have fair labor standards relative to us and that otherwise respect our norm and are part of the quote-unquote coalition of the willing who are willing to go up against the Chinese Communist Party and the Russians with regard to their aggression. So you could see some kind of favorable movement in all of those areas with regard to helping each other out and helping ourselves at the same time. Because I do think people have kind of woken up to what the menace is with regard to Russia and authoritarian dictators around the world. You know, the only thing I would add is the fact that billionaires in Davos are feeling glum. <laughs> you know, that never have they felt more glum than since we raised the dividend tax Mm -hmm. under the Obama administration. I mean, this is sometimes the concerns of Davos are not necessarily the concerns of the world economy, even, or especially of the U.S. economy. Including what's being served at the next meal. Yeah. And look, the coalition of the willing, if you take a step back, you got to say it was pretty surprising in the positive sense that we built the alliance back again. Now, who would have thought after four years of President Trump denigrating NATO and people arguing maybe NATO is going to dissolve, that there would be clamoring countries that have been neutral for decades saying, we want to get in NATO to protect us. It's kind of rejuvenated the alliances in a way that I'm hopeful, even separate from geopolitics, Maybe this will kind of cool some of the trade rhetoric that we saw in the previous four years where we declared Canada to be a national security threat to the United States and steal from Europe and and stuff like that. So we'll see how it goes. We're in a new moment. I think the fundamental question is, is that moment going to last? Or when COVID is gone, uh, please, God, let COVID be gone. But when COVID is gone... Are we going back? And here, I guess I'm a little bit of a cranky curmudgeon, I'm contrarian, something. It's a a cranky time. I think much of the talk of the way this has changed us forever, I think is not going to prove to be true. And I think there are very few events that are like the Great Depression that scar the memories of the people who lived through it for decades after. Much more common is if there was something that caused a trend for a long time, that's a sign that the fundamentals point in one way. And COVID reversing multi-decade trends for two years, I think that's going to go away. In my categories of those are moving away from large metropolitan areas, which took place in the last two years. That's a 150-year trend in the United States and elsewhere, the opposite, moving toward big metro areas. And that's because we're fundamentally more productive when we are together. 
And I think we're just going to rediscover that once COVID is done and people are going to start moving back to, to big cities. And the globalization of the supply chain happened because it's cheaper and there are economies of scale. And I think we might have some more tendency toward diversifying away from just a single country. But I think, as I say, five years from now, you're going to wake up. Somebody in the business is going to look out and say, why do we have a warehouse full of socks that we could buy on the open market for one tenth the price? What, what are we even doing? And then at that moment, the memory of COVID is kind of behind us. And I think we're going to go back to those previous trends. There's some ways in which I agree with Austin. Like we don't fundamentally reverse course very easily. Globalization is a ship that is way too big and heavy to turn around. And I, we don't really want to. I think when people say they want to make more things in the United States and they want to reduce globalization, they don't understand the price. They don't know what they're really asking for. They don't know how much they're asking to cut their consumption. They could choose to cut their consumption today already. Let's think about clothing, right? Because we have gone to manufacturing almost all of our clothing overseas, and Americans spend a much smaller share of their budget on clothing today than they you know, did 40 years ago, and they also own more clothes. We could spend even less on it, and we could spend more on the services that Americans provide us. We don't need to bring shirt manufacturing home and quadruple the price of shirts what we could do is spend our money on things that we value like childcare, spend more money on childcare. So I don't think the solution is bringing back industries in the U.S. where we can fundamentally make and source those goods more cheaply abroad. Now, I disagree with Austin on some of the trends like the work from home and live near family childcare. I think part of what's driven people out of the big cities is they moved to live next to a family member that could help them with child care. And I think a lot of families don't want to reverse that. They've learned that it's much better to actually have these intergenerational relationships to care for their elder parents themselves rather than putting them in a nursing home. We haven't seen employment in nursing residential care, start to recover. In fact, it's still trending downward because I think people don't want to put their loved ones in nursing care facilities when they saw what happened. The decline will stop, but I don't think we'll go back to the level of residential care. I think people want to be cared for in their home or they want to live near relatives or they want to live with relatives. And I think people want to rely on relatives and family members to do more child care or even for their own selves to do a little bit more child care. I'd love to see child care employment come back. I'd like to see it be affordable for families. But I do think that COVID did cause an entire generation of parents and their kids to reevaluate how we think about shaping families. Great. All right. So our focus this week is on the U.S. and global economic issues, but the mass murders of grade school children in Uvalde, Texas, couldn't help but dominate everyone's thoughts. I just wanted to turn over the floor in our remaining minutes for anyone's thoughts if you want to offer them about the murders and the policy debates we are having in the aftermath as an economist, as an American, as a human being. So earlier in the day before the shooting happened, I was talking with a journalist who was asking parents, what changed for you for the good when you became a parent. And I said, what I really think was for the good is my scope of empathy widened. I feel deeply in my heart the joy and the trauma of every parent out there and the joy and the trauma of their children. I've completely shifted my research focus to thinking more about what does the federal government do for children? What more should we be doing to invest in children? I think about things from a children's perspective, and I think it's been fantastic on how I think about economics, how I think about government and policy. And in the United States, you know, I really feel like we do not invest enough in children, and I feel like our politicians often let our children down. The politicians often see themselves as representing parents or that anybody voting age or older. 
And then children are just property of parents, and they don't have to think about the children's interests at all. And I think that's wrong. I think children are citizens of the country, and I think independent of their parents, we should be thinking about what's best for children. That shapes my belief in why we need to do more to fund early childhood education, why I think it's an absolute crime that only 9% of the federal budget goes to anything at all that would benefit or help or invest in children, 9%. The other 91% goes to adults or companies or corporations or the military. And I think that we should just really shift how we think about about kids. This empathy, though, makes something like this shooting, for me, incredibly painful. I can't even imagine how those children feel, how their parents feel, or I should say I can imagine, and it hurts too much to even talk to, to you about it too much, because I know how bad it is. And I'm I'm angry and I'm frustrated at politicians who say, well, the problem is mental illness and there's nothing we can do about that. The shooter was a kid himself. And it's our responsibility as a government. What are we doing letting children arm themselves like they're in military combat to deal with their pain when we know from research that their brains aren't developed? Their frontal cortex has got another seven years to go before it's fully developed. We've got an 18-year-old or 17-year-old or 16-year-old who's got a very, very immature frontal cortex with impulse control problems, and we're saying, yeah, military-grade assault weapons are pretty good for you. We won't let that kid buy a beer, but we'll let him buy an assault rifle? Let him have a beer. (laughs) I think we have to fundamentally ask ourselves... Like, what are we willing to sacrifice for our children and what aren't we? But I'm pretty angry at adults who aren't willing to do more to give their children a safe and comfortable childhood. I was shocked and saddened by the massacre of these beautiful, angelic children. My wife, Priya, and I have three beautiful school-aged children ourselves, and so what I saw touched me very personally. I think that we have to get past being desensitized to our efforts to pass a common sense gun reform legislation and getting stymied. We have to maintain the anger and the resolve and determination of this moment to push again. And that's what I intend to do, whether it's trying to get the background checks bill through Congress or my own legislation to impose a three-day waiting period for the purchase of handguns, I'm going to keep pushing. And I think at this point, we have to concentrate on eliminating the filibuster or creating a carve-out for this issue because we have to do something to save other kids and people in the memory of these 21 individuals who died senseless deaths in Uvalde. So where to begin? I guess with the feelings of fury and heartbreak at the sickening events on the ground, followed shortly by an anxious concern that even this horrific episode will settle into the nation's consciousness, along with the nearly 300 mass shootings in the country this year alone, and the sense of urgency that could fuel reform will leak away in a short week or two. Next, with a Me Too feeling with Betsy and the congressman, there's a way in which these episodes function as terrorism does, in that they seem to compel us to imagine that the mayhem and panic were raining down on us and our children. Next, outrage at the juxtaposition between the overwhelming American support for some gun reform and the fact that it's plainly a task for good government and the stalemate created by a minority party for disgusting reasons, so disgusting that they have to lie to Americans about the issue repeatedly. Republicans' rhetoric and supposed solutions, which, as best I can tell, run the gamut from prayers, mental illness treatment, Texas, by the way, is last in the nation here, immigration reform, and, risably, 
arming teachers and guards in school are inane ideas, and they know they are inane, but any constructive idea is killed out of the gate by the industry forces they slavishly serve. That leaves, or should leave on the table, common sense measures that have overwhelming support, even if they fall far short of the comprehensive overhaul we need to join the company of civilized nations where gun rights are concerned. But these already are halfway to passage, and they just need a sense of shame, if not concern, from 10 Republicans or else filibuster reform. A ban on some assault rifles, extensions of background checks to give more time to check into people with problematic backgrounds, and consideration of regulation of ammunition. And if this hellish episode isn't enough to make inroads on that modest agenda, then what possibly could be? Sad to say, that's not a rhetorical question. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you very much to Austin, Betsy, and Representative Krishnamurti. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts, and please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. We're available on the Spectrum News app, which provides local stories, weather, and information that matter to you and your community. Download the Spectrum News app on your Apple or Android device. You can follow us on Twitter, at TalkingFedsPod, to find out about future episodes and other Feds-related content. And you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters. Just go to patreon.com slash TalkingFeds. Just in the last few days, we posted an interview with David Halperin about student debt forgiveness and for-profit colleges. Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether it's for Talking 5 or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Mal Meliez. Associate Producer Olivia Henriksen. Sound Engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Adam Macias is our consulting producer. Production Assistance by Rhea Cohen-Gilbert, Kalena Tano, and Emma Maynard. Thanks very much to the great Steve Kerr. Not only a basketball legend, but a national warrior for sensible gun reform for talking to us on this horrendous week about possible firearm regulation. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. Talking Feds.